There we go. Hi, welcome to the 2RC Reading Group. Today we will be reading Ojibwa Warrior by Dennis Banks uh, in Chapter 5, Machiko. First, we are going to start by opening up with the Second Rainbow Coalition Statement of Unity. You have the floor, Comrade Andy. Okay. The, um, start with the preface to the Statement of Unity. The U.S. was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery of indigenous uh, and stealing the lands of indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to quote unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing out them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Huey P. Newton stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is the byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world of every ethnicity or nationality face a common enemy that is destroying life on earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity. The legacy of the first Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, the original Young Lords and Young Patriots organizations. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, uh, the masses have developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of the class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party stated at, that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in quote unquote race war. He said, it's a class struggle, God damn it. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state police, courts, jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush the emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. 
by upholding the 10 point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots organizations, and all other Rainbow Coalition members, we established our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold tie all organizations in our coalition. Uh, Okay, that's as far as I got. Is that end? I, I is that the completion of it? Oh no, here it is. Somehow this is messed up in the uh, in the paper that I'm reading. Uh, uh, history has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. Representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class represented by the Democratic Party and Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity and class consciousness organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we need to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people, boots on the ground. People. All power. All power. Thank you, Comrade Andy. All right. I go ahead and screen share the book. There we go. Can y'all yeah, see that okay? Yeah. yeah that's, that's good. Yep. Awesome. That's great. Anybody want me? What, people want, can I, can I start it? Go for it. Absolutely. Okay. You just, I just, I just got to, okay. Because there was a seed, a pine has grown here on the uh, on these barren rocks. If we yearn for each other, what can keep us from meeting? From the Majo's rule book of ten thousand leaves, Japan eighth eighth century. After passing an interest exam, I joined the Air Force in April of nineteen fifty four. Before going into basic training. I arranged for my mother to get half my pay. She got it every, every month, and I was glad to be able to do this much for her. First, I trained at Lockland Air Base, Air Force Base in Texas. Then I was transferred to Sam, to Fort Sam Houston. From, where, from there, I went to Boxdale Air Force Base, which was a huge camp in Sherman's Port, Louisiana. Oof. I was there for seven months training as an aerial photographer. At first, I worked as a cartographer, transferring photographic information to maps, then moved on to actual aerial phot photography. I went to a 90-day course for photography and graduated to do this kind of work for real. Because the information was classified, the FBI did a background check on me. I received a top, a top secret clearance from the Air Force. Soon I was handling top secret material involving aerial shots of Korea, Manchuria, China, and parts of the Soviet Union. I found it easy easy to adjust to military life. I guess my years at boarding school prepared me for another round of obedience and discipline. I shined my shoes and did all the things you are supposed to do in the military. <laughs> I was I was into that kind that level of toxic fantasy. I wanted to fly planes. I wanted to kill a commie for Christ or oh God. The patriotism in me was so strong that I defended the military and its policies, including whatever the government was doing overseas. 
I defended the war in Korea and was ready to defend any war in the USA might be involved in. I was so patriotic, it was ridiculous. I dream of being the general of the whole goddamn Air Force. <laughs> While I was still in basic training, I met a guy by the name of Ken Kubashi. He was of Japanese descent. We were both assigned to the Second Air Force, and we became close friends. We knew another guy, a Chinese kid named Jim Toy. The three of us were stuck together through our entire military careers. Both guys were from California. Jim was from the South Stockholm area, while Ken was from Redondo Beach. I think the, the, the initial friendship was linked to the color of our skin. I felt somehow related to them. We just naturally gravitated towards one another. We all got our assignments to the same base in central Japan. This was my first time out of the country. They moved us to California, then we boarded the ship USS Breckenridge Bre with 4,000 other GIs going to Japan. I got a KP assignment for 30 days on that ship. I hated day, to, day after day KP, and I was seasick for the first three or four days out from the constant rolling of the waves. I couldn't sleep. And if I did, and if I slept, did, and if and if his sleep did overtake me, I was still sick when I awoke. I closed down. I knew I didn't like my Navy life, and I didn't care to learn much about it. A Navy ship is a Navy ship, and all I cared was that it was taking us to Japan. From the beginning, I was in love with Japan. When we arrived, I was sent to a small base in Osaka, Osaka called Otami Air Base. They had, they had old-time twin-engine B-27 reconnaissance bombers they used for aerial photography of Manchuria and Korea. We got all our equipment settled in and went to a week-long orientation about China. Japanese people, their culture, the, the history of the war with Japan, and what we were doing there as occupation forces. They told us that certain planes were off limits to us. We were instructed that there were rules we had to abide by. Even though the country was under U.S. military occupation, we still we sub subject to Japanese law as well as, their, as our own Air Force regulations. We were not supposed to become, to become involved with the Japanese people on a personal level. The watchword was was no fraternal, frat, frat, oh God, frat, oh, frat, fraternalization. Well, naturally, these rules could not be enforced because many of us had to work with Japanese people. I spent a lot of time on base on my duties, but on my time off, I was getting acquainted with Japanese culture, taking, to, talking to people, asking questions, going to museums, and absorbing as much as I could. I began to pick up the language. I studied Shin, Shinto and Buddhist beliefs. I, I liked to attend the festivals held at Takurasaka, North Oskia, Osaka. I fell in love with the whole country. I knew I was there to accomplish a military mission, but in my heart, I somehow felt that something on a very personal level was happening to me. We were surrounded by bars that were right off base. We called them the Thousand Yard Strip, saloons, pawn shops, clip joints, and pool houses. I was said that if you didn't, if you didn't hook your watch, drink a gallon of beer, and get laid, you and get laid, you were not a man. Oh God! You, there was one bar where the guys from our squad squadron went call when when called the top hot top hot. I started going there too. I didn't like whiskey then, and in fact, didn't like hard liquor at all. 
but I began to like beer. In the excitement of this new place, there was peer pressure to act macho. You had to drink, drink and have mindless pay for sex. Mindless pay for sex. I had, I had, I had sex before in high school, but it was a bashful thing, playful, even not a rowdy, drunken affair. But I was curious. I kind of wanted to go to one of those pool houses, but not so much for sex. I wanted to see what a pool house was like. The military is is a training ground. It teaches you things in your off off hours, just as it does in base. Even while you are a kid, you start learning about joining the Air Force or Navy or Marines. They tell you you going to see the world, have a woman in every port. Then when you are actually dead, you're supposed to be macho and use women as sex objects. Wow. <clears throat> I talked to Jim and Ken about it. What should we do first, guys? Jim Toy was a museum kind of guy. He said, well, there's some theaters and museums we should go to. I knew I want, I knew what I wanted and go Gobashashi was a cross was a cross between what I wanted, what I wanted and what Jim wanted. Yes, I wanted to go to the theater and the museum, but I wanted to see meet people, to see who they were or to see who they were in all aspects of life, to touch them and visit with them. Of course, we saw them working as school boards, as construction workers and in offices on the base, but I wanted to explore. The, ten, the thousand yard strip was a good place to start. So we got our buses, our passes, and walked down to the road. Of course, there were girls calling out to, calling out to us. Hey, GI, do you want some Coca-Cola? <laughs> oh God, this is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy shit, man. There were, there were girls who worked, worked in the bars. Their job was to get you to drink and spend money at their bar. But there were other girls who would call out, hey, G.I., do you want a short time? That was the first time I heard that expression. The guys from the base told us they were asking you for either a brief time or all night. A short time was maybe half an hour with them. You pay for some sex, then, then leave. All night obviously had a different price tag. But we didn't go in there. I was I, I, I was just absorbing all kinds of impressions. Not every store or station was a bar. Not every house was a whole house. There were little bakeries, a small grocery shop, toy shops, pharmacies, and a lot of rich shores. Itami sits in the hills near Osaka. In fact, all of Japan is, is hilly and mountainous. The country's few few flat areas are used for farming. There was a particular smell around Utami. It wasn't a constant, but you would get a whiff of it sometimes, and you would know that there were honey buckets nearby. A honey bucket was a container full of human waste that mm. had been dug out of the toilets to be mixed with with an addictive den used as a fertilizer in the rice fields. Oh my God, this is crazy. On base, the shadows and toilets were just like in America, but Japanese toilets were different. Different. You had to squat down on a little commode that had no apparent bottom to it. All the waste would go straight down into a holding container. From the outside, the farming community would dig it and use it for fertilizer. I found out that human waste is a great recycled agriculture. <laughs> oh God, agriculture enhancer in a country without cattle and animal menu. menu. But when, but when I first saw a Japanese toilet, it's kind of repulsed me. I explore, I explored. Along sometimes and other times, I hung around with Ken and Jim. We went on different excursions, hiking or to the movies, and of course to the Thousand Yard Strip. 
on our first outing where one of us said, let's go have a beer. And to the top hat we went. We were greeted by three girls who introduced themselves. As we sat down, we went them. It was understood what that they would be company for us as long as we spent money on them. We tried to talk. They were they with their broken English and me with no Japanese at all of uh, bad communication here. There was music and dancing and a comfortable feeling. I watched I watched another girl behind the bar being bring drinks for us. She was very pretty. There was a mystery, mystic quality about being with women my age who were of different race but with the same color skin. We began to talk about little things like where I, I was fun, about music, and whether we knew how to dance. Ken was about to talk a little Japanese with, a, with the girl sitting next to him. Ken was engaged in conversation in much the same way I was. Right then I sensed something inside me that would never leave me. Even though it was a bar city, these people saw me as a human being. Hmm. Well, naturally, I was a GI and they saw that first, but there was never give me money or anything like that. If you spend a dollar or two dollars, that was all right. Five dollars was all right. And if we went in there and spent just 50 cents in, in four hours, that was all right too. I was never propositioned by any of those girls. The first time we stayed for perhaps an hour and a half, then Grim said, let's go. So we drank up, drank up, said goodbye to the ladies and walked out. We had a, a, a originally set out for the train station to go sightseeing, but there we, there we were on our first encounter off the military base with three nationals who didn't know us before, and we were excited about it. We never did make it to, to that train station. Jim was talking about cameras, and I was still talking about the girls. Ken, I said, those girls were nice. I want to visit there some some more. We eventually made it to the Photoshop where Grim brought a camera, and then we found a place to buy some apples and oranges to Mount John. By this time, it was getting late, and we had to go back in, in the at the base by 9.30. We were on our way back when I said, let's stop, let's just pop it back into the bar and see what's going on. It was pretty crowded. The girl the girl I had, the girl I had been sitting with was sitting with another GI though, I thought. Well, that's her job. I looked at the girl behind the bar again and caught her eyes. She just looked and kind of smiled a little bit. I disappeared though to the door and I thought and I thought about our first out evening out. I thought about racism. Here in this country I didn't sense it and I didn't see what whites surrounded me all the time. And I liked it. <clears throat> I enjoyed the company of the people of this country, the people I was falling in love with. <clears throat> the next morning I went to the library on base during, during break. There were all kinds of books on the Japanese language. And I thought, well, I learned it. Of course, when somebody goes to Japan, they buy these little books entitled How to Speak Japanese in Five Easy Lessons. Ha, huh, I'll buy that and get somebody to help me. And so I did. Somebody else, please take over. Okay. <sighs> I'll take over. Oh, okay. Go ahead, bro. Cool. Go ahead. Um... Um, comrade, um, comrade, say, um, could you, um, could I, um, as I read, could you, um, could you move your, um, the, um, the PDF as I read these? I don't have it pulled up. Oh, that's me doing it. Or, I got um, you. Oh, oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I thought it was comrade. I thought it was comrade Che. Um, I told Ken, um, Ken and Jim, or Gim, I'm going back to that bar tonight. Gim said, yeah, me too. But first, I'm going to go check out this museum. It's only open until 7. 
So, I went back to the bar alone. I ordered one beer and talked with another girl for maybe half an hour. Then I went out to walk around. I followed a side street that went up where I could see people working in the rice fields. Three hours went by while I sat watching from the edge of a, ca of a canal. How does I pronounce it? With my feet dangling over the water. A canal. My attention was absorbed by men balancing the honey buckets on their necks and shoulders and women working knee deep in the fields. I could hear them speaking, feel the culture of these people. Way off in the distance, I could hear some kind of Japanese string music. This feeling that there was a purpose for me other than the military began to move through me. I kept going back to the top hat, um, to the top hats. The young girl who was um, who was bartending greeted customers as they came in. Some when so when she greeted me, I asked what her name was. She replied, Mashik, um, Mashiku, Mashiko. I told her my name, and she said, "You're you're new, GI." I said, "Yes." Then she spoke to everyone else in Japanese. Mino-san, um, Godiwa American Indian. Later on, I understood that she. That she said to her friends, this is an American Indian. Okay. Y'all came over to talk to me and shake hands with me. We sat down a little, a little while together. Um, behind us, the jukebox played rock and roll, Hank Williams, country western. And it's such a contrast to the music that flew across the fields and the canals from the from the Kato and and the Biwa. At least I pronounce it. I was about, um, it was about my second week in Japan. I kept asking her questions about herself, but she wanted to know more about me. That there was such an, there was such an aura of joy around her. Um, I didn't even go to the dinner on the next night. I went straight to the top hat, right back to her. We talk and talk and dance a little bit. She showed me how to dance the box and step and and, and jitterbug. Today, those are still the only steps I know. She would do these little things that made me feel so cared for. I would be smoking a cigarette, and she would flick ashes off my shirt, or she would strain me, my, or she would strain my tie while talking with me, caring about me. She was sixteen, now seventeen, and we were falling deeply in love. Aw, something wonderful was blossoming for, for me. Um. After about two weeks, I thought about her all the time. So one Friday, I told her that I was getting a three-day pass and could be gone from the base um, two whole days. She said, do you want to see my parents? I live with them over at Taka, um, Takarazuka, about, the, about two hours from here. I said, yes, yes, yes. I packed a little bag, and, the night we, and that night we went. I stayed with her until she finished her work at the top hat around midnight. Uh, we went up to the to the train station in a hurry because the last train was about to leave. A couple of hours later, when we arrived at Takarazuka, she told me that she felt it might be better to show up at my at my parents' house in the daylight. She said tonight we'll we'll go to the motel. Of course, I thought that was a great idea. We had to wake up. Um, we had to wake up the motel clerk to show us to our rooms. As was the custom, we took off our shoes and went through the wood and paper side um, sliding doors. The inside was like a traditional Japanese home with with um, with futons, futons and hibachi in the middle of the living room with a table over it. Machiku served me some hot tea and then said that she was going to have a bath. She asked me if I would join her. I had never exposed myself naked to a woman, much less bathed with one, and I wasn't sure I understood what she meant. She was saying, come on, hurry up, take off your clothes. Yet there was nothing sexual in what she was suggesting. Until that time, I didn't realize that in Japan it was natural to be undressed and, and bathed together. We took off all of our clothes and stood totally naked. <clears throat> There are, were uh, these little stools to sit. There's there are these little stools to sit on to wash yourself up. We sat down, lathered all up, and then took more hot water and poured it over ourselves. Then we got into this big hot tub for maybe a half an hour or so. The water in the tub was so hot I thought I would die. 
I tried to jump out, but she laughed and pulled me back. It was hotter than a sweat lodge run by Crow Dog, which can be almost un uh, undurable. After a time, we got out and lathered up again, really scrubbing ourselves clean. We did this whole process twice. She scrubbed my back, which embarrassed me a little. I almost grabbed her hand to tell her to stop, then I would do it to myself. But she teased me out of it and slapped me on the butt, saying, Come on, you're a GI. You're supposed to be tough. She acted like she thought I was afraid of the water because it was too hot. I was looking at her. She was so beautiful. I was seeing her for the first time, naked and relaxed in all her loveliness. I met her parents, kind, simple folk who smiled and bowed to me. I bowed back just like they did. They served me fragrant um, tea in tiny cups. They couldn't speak English, um, but seemed to approve of my friendship with her daughter. I realized I was falling in love for sure, even after just two weeks with um, Ma Mashiko. Mashiko... Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mashiko Inoue. I found that I found that I not only loved her for her, for her for herself, but also for being Japanese. A passion flooded over me for her country with all the sights, sounds, and smells. All of it opened my vivid feet. I asked Mashiko to go with me to different places. We would ride the trains together and do our shopping and take in the sights around the countryside. We even went to see traditional kabuki plays. She was the first woman to care for me, to bathe me, to cook for me, to listen to me, and sing with me. She knew something about American Indians, and even though she couldn't speak um, my Anishinaabe language, um, she learned a few. Um, she learned a few Indian songs, and she taught me some Japanese songs. We would sing together. We we rented a little place of our own close to the base soon after the trip to Takarazuka. I would go there every evening after work and return to the base each morning. We spent six months in, in at, at, at Itami Air Base. She would never ask why I did. All she knew was that all she knew that was that I was a GI. For men in the military, relationships with women are a very um are very insecure. You're subject to forces beyond your control. Some total stranger with gold braid on his sleeve with and tear your world to pieces with, with a flick of a pen. I knew what a relationship with a woman could lead to, could lead to for a GI, but there were, but there I was getting myself involved deeper every day. After six months, our unit was transferred to uh, um, Yokoda Air Base, which was a huge strategic air command, um, SAC, based outside Tokyo. There they had the big bombers. B forty sevens. We were assigned to the to the five hundred forty eighth reconnaissance tech squadron to do more aerial photography work. I asked Mashiku to move up there with me. A friend of mine, Joe Golgoski, also had a Japanese girlfriend who was named Judy. Mashiko and Judy were close friends, so we all moved to y Yoko Yokoda together. We rented a whole house and stayed there for for the next three years. Damn. I used to bicycle the six or seven miles we lived from the base. I loved my life there with, with Mashiko. She was fascinating. Through her, I began to learn more and more about the Japanese people. For the first time, I heard about the native um, aborigines, Aber the Ainu, but I wouldn't become acquainted with them until 20 more years had passed. One morning in 1956, we got an early wake-up call. Hurry up, hurry up, get moving. We were there. Uh, we were told there would be a demonstration against Tashikwa Air Base by Japanese "quote unquote" troublemakers, but we already knew what it was about. The air base, which was about 30 miles from Yokota Air Base, was going to be expanded into the into the into the into the SAC base. The plan was to extend the runway by at least 1,000 yards to make way. For the B-47s and B and B-5 and, and the B and the B-52s that were coming in. To facilitate this, a great chunk of useful farmland had to be con condemned and destroyed. A Japanese court fought the move, and a mass public demonstration was to take place against a takeover by, by the U.S. Air Force. Good. 
the farmers had begun to organize and students were organizing behind the farmers. It developed into a strong opposition to the U.S. military. Soon there was a growing number of farmers, students, Buddhists, monks, and nuns, and the ordinary Japanese citizens um, banding together in demonstrations. As the crowd of demonstrators grew uh, uh, larger and larger, our command post told us that we were going to on that we were going on full 24-hour alert with combat readiness. On this particular day, and then called us at, at three o'clock um, on the morning to tell us to grab our gear and go stand out there at attention with the rifles and live ammunition they had they had issued us. We were only a short distance from where the line of the Minnesotans were, were yeah. forming. Sorry, give me a second. All right. Forming. Our officer is stationed at one man every 10 feet around the parameter of the entire base. I stood at the end of the runway that was to be lengthened. Ken Kobayashi, Kobayashi was to be my right was to be my right with Sergeant Johnson on the other side of him. To my left was Gim Toy. We stood at attention for what must have been two or three days in a row. An officer had told us that if any of the of the demonstrators set foot on the base itself, we would have to shoot. First, a warning shot. If that didn't stop them, we were, we were to fire uh, on the demonstrators. You have to shoot them, he said. We could not understand this. These people were nothing more, um, were nothing more, were nothing more than nonviolent demonstrators. This was their land that our air force was trying to take away. Here I was living with a Japanese girl, and many of my friends were doing the same. Our sergeant had a Japanese wife. Sergeant Johnson said to the captain, "Shoot at what? You want us to shoot to scare them? You want us to shoot over them with a warning shot?" The captain replied, "Shoot to kill. Fucking hell." It was 1956. There was no war going on, but the war, but the, but that was the order. Ken, the sergeant, and I talked about the predicament that we found ourselves in. What do we do? I said, these people, this is their land, and if they come over the fence, it's still their land. I don't know that. I don't know that could screw a Japanese. For wanting to occupy his own land, Sergeant Johnson said, "Well, if anything happens, it'll, I'll just fire a warning shot. But we are not going to shoot anyone for this. I'll be damned if I'll do that. I will help defend the United States of America. Um, I will help defend the United States of America. I did take that pledge, but I haven't seen anyone try to invade America lately. That was the kind of talk going on going on among the GIs assigned to this mission." About 10 o'clock on the third morning, we heard the drums. Yeah. Um, we heard the drums. We were standing on the base side of a big cyclone fence about 10 feet high. Yeah. On the other side of, uh, of that were the Japanese National Defense Forces. Beyond them was a row of police. We were facing four or 5,000 demonstrators. Out in front were Buddhist monks and nuns in their orange robes beat, um, beating huge drums. The taikos. The rhythmic um, pounding grew louder and louder. I had never heard so many drums in my life. Off in, the off in the distance, a mass of orange robed people had appeared, chanting and hitting the drums, thousands and thousands of people. There must have been four or five thousand of them. I had seen monks and nuns before, but not uh, of this particular sect. Their heads were shaved. When they reached the front of demonstrations, they all kneeled down maybe 15 feet on the other side of the police. They continued to chant um, Na Moi O Ren Ge Koi for several hours. We were at parade rest, talking together about all of this. Yeah. Years later, I would understand what the chant means, even though there is no, there is no literal translation of it. When do you when you have a good feeling such as the birth of a baby, you chant. Or if you hear of the death of, of somebody, you chant in some words in a sorrowful voice of... Oh, th oh hi, hi, Thurman left. 
of. If you see something beautiful, you say it. It means beauty. It means peace. There we stood in opposition to these people, us holding the M-16s and our sergeant with, with, his, with his BAR, his Browning automatic rifle, fed, up, fed by its belt of ammo. All of a sudden, a commotion broke out way over to our right. Then the yelling and screaming began, coming closer and closer. We could see the Japanese police rushing and rushing the demonstrators. The the uh the helmeted Japanese defense forces seemed to be uh, um seems, seems to be there to back up the police. We had seen students moving towards the fence when the police suddenly charged them with weapons and heavy sticks, the Buddhist monks and nuns sitting still on the ground in front of us were chanting when the police rushed them in a frenzy and started cracking skulls with a terrible sound as if they were they were striking coconuts. The monks and nuns did not fight back. It was a terrible thing to witness. I saw elderly nuns with blood streaming down their faces. Sergeant Johnson suddenly grabbed his be his his bar and, and a fired and fired around into the air. Then he hollered, stop it, stop it, halt. The police stopped beating the people and turned around to face us. The Japanese Defense Force turned around as well, not knowing what to do. And in, the, in, the criti in that critical moment, when I saw them turning around to look at us, I grabbed my rifle, cocked it, and pointed it up in the air. Almost all the GIs did, this, did the same thing. I believe that by firing his weapon, Sergeant Johnson may have saved hundreds of lives. In that confused moment, anything could have happened. But what everyone saw was Sergeant Johnson running towards the fence, shouting in Japanese, Stop the beating! Stop it! Stop it! Then all was quiet, off in the distance behind, as I could hear the, the sirens coming. The military police headed, heading towards us had, had heard the shooting. Sergeant Johnson must have let off must have left off at um at least fifteen or twenty rounds. He returned to where we to where to where to where we were and said Kobayashi, this thing accidentally tri um trip fired and it went off like that. That's what happened. Kobayashi said, That's why I saw. Sergeant Johnson said Airman Banks, this BAR trip fired. I finally jam, jammed it up and stopped it. I said, as far as I know, Sergeant, what's that's what I saw too. The military police arrived and came around toward us with, with, with their guns drawn. They for, they First they asked excitedly with, with Japanese interpreters, asked what happened. The interpreters pointed at us. Then the military police came over to us, and one of them said, Sergeant, what happened here? Sergeant Johnson said, I went up to my rifle down like that, and all of a sudden it started shooting. I grabbed it and managed to stop it. The MP asked Ken, did you see anything? Ken said, I was standing at, at parade. Yes. <coughs> I saw Sergeant Johnson put the rifle down and start firing the MP looked around and said, did anyone else see anything? I said, I saw the same thing. Then turned, then turned around, went over by the fence to confer and came back. All right, you guys listen. We're going to take you out of here and bring in somebody else. They picked about five of us and gave us a rifle out, out of the area and we returned to our barracks. They didn't question us any further. Ugh. I felt sick at what I had seen and ashamed of the uniform I was wearing. I remembered Sergeant Johnson firing and yelling for the beating to stop. I had looked past the Japanese defense forces and then and could clearly see the monks who were trying to help the injured. They were carrying them away to safety. That terrible scene has remained with me for all of these years. I, I shall never forget those, dem those demonstrators were peaceful people literally being beaten to death. Since that time, during my struggles in the American Indian movement, I have seen BIA police wield their clubs and Indians like that. Each time my memory flashed back to what I saw that day in Japan. Um, Mashiko and I had been together for two years when she became pregnant. It was, inev it was inevitable. After our little baby girl, Mashiko was born. Um, after our little baby girl, Mashiko, was born, I felt wonderful. We decided to get married in the old Japanese way and went to and went to a, a Shinto priest. Mashiko looked so beautiful in her wedding um, kimono. We drank our 
regret, regret, um, sorry, we drank to our mutual happiness from tiny cups of sake. I took the marriage document back to the base and tried to arrange for us to have a civil ceremony as well. They said, we do not recognize such marriages, and we are not allowing members of the armed forces to marry Japanese subjects. I said, I said that we had already been married. The hell you are, was the reply. Hey, I said, we have a baby and we have a baby now and a child needs help. They said that, that Mashiko could fill out the application to be married, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't do any good. We had to we had to fill out all this paperwork. I was called in by the OSI, the Office of Strategic Investigations, and told Um Sorry, I and and told that I could not marry her because her family were members of the Socialist Party in Japan and she might be a communist. I was baffled and, and angry. I told them Mashiko was not in the least bit interested in politics. They said, they said, we are denying your marriage application and we are also taking away your top secret clearance. I didn't care about the top secret clearance, but I was shattered by the announcement. I realized that I had been living in a state of self-delusion. Air Force life had made me uh, had made me mentally lazy. As a GI, I was doing mostly nothing, just taking a vacation from, from thinking, but it was the hour of awakening. I had been guarding, guarding the rampart the ramparts of the American empire, but now I felt like the, those crow and, and, uh, those pro and Ari, Arikara Indians who um um who after scouting um who after scouting for Custer and fighting on behalf of the whites were pitied against their own brothers the ch the ch I don't know if I'm pronouncing the, this word right the the Chine and Lakota Cheyenne my J Cheyenne thank you. My Japanese yeah. family members were called, uh, were called, uh, um, yep, gooks, saw, and, saw, and slant eyes, quote unquote, by whites. And those who suffered from these names were people just like me. Was I not a quote unquote slant eye as all American Indians are? The American Indian, um, the American Air Force, which I had thought of as a friend, turned out to be an enemy. I started drinking in a, in a destructive way whiskey with beer chasers, all called boil, boiler makers. I began to change to get rowdy drunk along with, with the rest of the GIs. I still had Jim Toy and Ken. Kobayashi as as friends and we've been friends all of these many years since the disastrous time. I was determined that I was never going to return to the United States again. I did not want to return, for I was so much in love with my wife and child and the country and its people. I had extended my tour of duty for two years, but then suddenly they ordered me back to the United States. I said, no, I'll take my discharge right here in Japan. They said, no, Banks, you have to go back to the States to get your, your discharge. I I grabbed Mashiko and the baby and went to and went a wall. We moved to another place, but they found us and court martialed me. I was found guilty. They took away my stripes, suspended my pay, and put me in a jail for thirty days. When I got out, I managed to find Mashiko again. We moved to a new hiding place until two months late later, when they discovered us and took me away. This time they sent me to the, to the States in chains. <clears throat> but wow. um, my image of the United States was already shattered. My belief in America crushed and my duty and obligation finished. I want nothing more to do with, with the military or the U.S. government. I just wanted one thing, and that was to stay with my family in the country. I had come... I, I had come to love. I had even started to speak the language, but I was on a plane... A, bound for the states we stopped in mid-ocean at the at the midway islands and i attempted to escape but they arrested me again handcuffed me and put me on the plane back to back to the states someone had assured me that when i when i got back i would get i would get my mustering i'll pay one thousand two hundred dollars they said they said if you're so stuck up on 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 that uh they said, if you're so stuck up on that Japanese person, you can turn back. You can turn around and fly back. I had told 
Mashiko to wait for me. I didn't know how long it might take, but I intended to go straight back as quickly as possible. They didn't give me the money. They gave me pieces of it in little installments over a period of time. There was never enough to buy that ticket. I wrote Mashiko that I was going to have to work somewhere for a while to earn the money to come back for her. I was staying in St- I was staying in Stockton, in California, where I started working with 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 Gim. I was hoping to to scrap together enough money to get to get back to Japan, but the money was never there. I I got so depressed about the whole situation. I started drinking again. I always wrote Mashiko, I will I will be coming, I will be back, but it never happened. I was only able to afford the barest necessities of life and and the price of a bottle. The weeks turned to months, the months to years. After a period after a period in Stockton, I went back to the reservation. I had drained my mother tell her about my wife and baby my relatives thought i would be bringing them back with me they all said dennis where is your wife mashiko and a new baby they had to tell them the story about how all our plans had been destroyed i would still write to her and she would write me back two years went by the figures of mashiko and the baby were fading in the fog i went on drinking eventually i moved to minneapolis and started getting involved with various indian um issues there i began to settle down i met another woman and my life took some new twists and turns over the course of the next few years 14 years later i was in a position of leadership during the siege at wounded knee south dakota some videographers from japan were documenting what was happening there for Japanese television. They were going, they were doing a story on me, and we met together for several days. I don't know, but maybe Mashiko saw the footage on TV because a call came in from Japan to to the place of Minneapolis where I had an address. The people who were were staying there didn't get her message to me until seven months had passed because of the trials that followed. The long siege I wouldn't need. The message, um, the message said that our child Mashiko was fifteen year was fifteen years old, going to high school, and that everything was okay. The number must have been taken incorrectly because when I tried to call her back, I got a hotel. There was no one there by the name of Mashiko um, Inoue. Five years later. I finally went back to Japan. I knew the places where Mashiko had lived and her parents had been. I went back to her parents' place. They had moved some 20 years before that. I looked up her last name, but there must have been more than 300 people in the province by that name. It was like looking at, at, in America for a person named jo, jo, Jones or Smith. <laughs> I got on the phone and called 15 to 20 different people. I went to the school Mashiko had attended and left word there in case there was ever a reunion in the 1953 class. All of this was very emotional for me. I had ran into one of her friends who said that Mashiko had returned, of course, and that she had raised our daughter. Mashiko had grown into a young woman herself and was at a university in northern Japan. At that time she was twenty um she was twenty four years old. That was the saddest part for me. I was anxious to look at Mashiko and then my focus shifted to uh, wait. Um uh, um I was anxious to locate Mashiko, and then my focus shifted to, to Mishiko. But I, I did not find her. I went again to Japan 10 years um, after that. In 1988, I had released a book out there about my life and put out a call for Mashiko to contact the publisher. No one ever came. I even went back to, to the little place we had rented, but it had been torn down. Even the old grocery store where we used to trade was gone. I acknowledge that I have a child somewhere in Japan. It brings me sorrow that I never found her. It must be the same for children looking for their parents. I travel back and forth to Japan quite often now, about twice a year. Every now and then, a, a young girl will come up to me and say, my father is an American Indian. Shivers run down. Shivers run through my whole body. But then she is not Mish- Mishiko at all, but someone else's child. I am hopeful that one day I will see her. Someday, if they... If they is kind, I will finally find the ones I lost in that ill-fated time. Wow. God fucking damn. That was horrible. That was so fucking hell. You know, a lot of, you know, that happens a lot. 
in, in foreign in, in foreign countries. Yep. Especially during time of during time of war where GIs go, you know, let me call them GIs for that matter. GIs would go, you know, to these countries, man, and get somebody get a few women pregnant and then they come back home and they leave the, child, the children behind, you know. So I, I know a friend of mine, man, he he uh, he had similar situations to that. And um he but he was in Vietnam and he uh he met a Vietnamese woman <clears throat> and uh she got pregnant by him. But uh he wasn't there long enough. You know, and when he came back to the States, uh, he tried to get in contact with, with that Vietnamese system, but unfortunately he wasn't able to. So he knew, he knew that he, uh, he had, he had a child and that brother I'm talking about was an Attica brother, you know, Damn. and, uh, he, 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 he passed away a few years ago. So I just wonder whatever happened to his kid, you know? Hopefully his kid is still alive. Yeah, hopefully, you know. But that happens a lot, especially a, a lot of those that that that, that I call it whole house. That's what it was. You know, a lot of colonized women's men, they go there looking, looking to, they're not looking for sex. They're trying to get some money so that they can live. You yep. know, because life over there in places like that is not it's not it's it's not a, it's not really good, you know. And so they yep. try to survive off the little bit of money that they get from us. Yep. You know? So I don't know. But yeah, just just reading that was horrible, you know. Um and I imagine and I and I imagine for um for banks, I imagine that it must have been very eye-opening that the same shit that happened to his people, to the indigenous people of the Americas, was happening to the same to, to the same indigenous people of Japan and and the Japanese people, and it must have been heartbreaking to know that he was the one that was causing their pain, upholding white supremacy in Japan. You know, and, and, and you know, unfortunate and unfortunately, that's what happens to a lot of to a lot of um, um to a lot of non-white people um in the US R recruiters specifically love to specifically target you know um um black people or indigenous people or people from non-white communities um who are who are impoverished and they tell them hey you know we can take you off poverty all you have to do is join the military and they end and and, and then they end up and they end up um benefiting from um, from the oppression and impoverishment of these non-white communities by making them join the military to uphold the oppression and exploitation of their own people and people abroad. And it's fucking disgusting. So, yeah, it just... God, that's horrible, mm. you know. Um, I hope um, I hope Banks found his daughter, or at least I hope that his daughter is living a long and, and happy life. <laughs> mm. One of... One of the things I uh, do is uh, I buy different ephemera, uh, different old photos and things like that. And I recently got a whole batch of photos that were taken during World War II by a, a Navy photographer. And they, but they weren't stationed in the European theater. They weren't stationed in um, the Asian Pacific Theater, they were stationed in the Car Caribbean, in uh, Trinidad and Puerto Rico, that that these guys were there, you know, there was something to do with, you know, looking out for German U-boats or something like that. But there was hundreds of them, thousands of them. They took over everything. They, you know, when they, when the U.S. imperialists moved, they moved to secure everything. And one of the things that I noticed in looking at these photographs is everybody, they were all behaving like, you know, the, the typical ugly American. The, the photo, a lot of the photographs had like derogatory things to say about the native people, you know, disgusting things that they, you know, they just wrote on the back of a photograph, you know, look at this. 
look at this, look at this, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, you know, those are people that were enslaved in the Caribbean and the, and they're making a living the best they can, you know, but it was like, it was like, I was amazed, I don't know why, but I was kind of amazed at how derisive and, and he, you know, nasty this this was. And I think it, it really starts to show like when in this uh, piece that we just read that you're there for a reason. And if you don't understand that, it'll become clear to you. You you will do what the government wants done in exactly. those situations. So there was like mm -hmm. he he believed he was a true believer who finally saw the light you know and yep. paid paid a heavy price for anything like that i have a young yep. friend who went to um iraq you know his whole family were uh leftists and and but he said no i'm gonna join the marines i'm gonna prove myself a man you know and he went and you know paid paid heavy dues for it. ptsd is the least of it and he he hasn't he hasn't resolved it yet in his own mind, you know. He's 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 like anti imperialist on the one hand and he's gung ho marine on the other because when when you're in those situations, your friends are the closest thing to you, the in the ones in sort of in the foxhole. You don't the, you know, those are the people your life depends on. You become very, very close to your comrades in arms, no matter whether you're <laughs> Uh, in a communist army or you're in the u.s army those those things are very deep so to work with uh with to work with the military personnel in a revolutionary manner has always been uh an exceedingly dangerous thing an exceedingly important thing to do right now um you know as they're trying to mobilize the the, the uh young men and women of this country to be their their shock troops for fascism, there's an opportunity for revolutionaries to appeal to their to their better sense, to their to their commonality with the oppressed. A lot of a lot of military families that I know of are on food stamps and they're just scraping by themselves. They have a commonality with you know us, but they not as long as they're willing to do the dirty work so it's it's a sticky wicket and uh, i shared a meme the other day it showed these two two guys these uh, black and latino um recruiters in a high school and the meme the meme said these are the real groomers they're grooming your kid to be uh a cannon fodder and uh yep. And 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 that's what it's about. Um, it's it's damn. It's really it's 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 really good. Uh, chapter that we just read it really brings out a lot of stuff on a real personal level that's profoundly important. Beautifully said, comrade. Beautifully said. Um, you know, I've said it before, and I'll say it. Again, um, there is no such thing as going into the military and not serving in combat. You know, it doesn't matter what position you are in the military, even if it's just lo lo logistics. If you're deployed, you are given a gun and you're expected to shoot someone. And that's the truth. It doesn't matter what position you are in the military because because because, because even if you are not directly shooting the innocent, even if you are not directly, you know, um, killing um, the masses, you're you are you are either building um, you're either b building building tools of, of warfare that um, that will be used to kill um, to, 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 um, to kill um, entire entire nations or, um, or 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 you're healing soldiers up to event to enable them to go to, to go back into the field of combat to continue oppressing, exploiting, and subjugating um, entire nations through cruelty. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you know, it, people know, people have heard of, I know that y'all know, 
bow down. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Edward, Edward Snowden. Oh yeah, yeah. Remember, he sure. was uh, he was so much dedicated to the NSA, and and he was doing his job. And then one day, one day out of out of out of the blue, man, he managed to come into some information that was vital to the to, to the American people, and he felt his his felt his obligation. To reveal that and expose that to the public, and he did. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, look what happened. He had to suffer the consequences. Currently, he's somewhere in Russia. Right. He, he he can't even he 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 can't even come back because if he comes back, they're gonna put him in jail and and, and probably kill him because he had too much information that he exposed. You know, and I wonder, I wonder about the United States, how much more information that hasn't been exposed. Somebody somewhere is going to expose it, you know, and there, as a result, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people in the army right now that are fighting against it. That, you know, some of them are even left and some ain't even going, you know, to all these wars that's been happening within the last five years. You know, uh, I'm. I'm accumulating a whole bunch of names of people, man, that 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 were in the, in, the, in the armed forces and just refused to even go overseas, you know. Mm -hmm. So you you know, so when we talk, I don't know, I don't know what's the secret. What seems to be the secret? We this this country is supposed to be a democratic a country where everything every you know is democratically. We're supposed to be by the people for the people and whatever. You know, and yet it's not like that. You right. know, the reality is not like that. You know, and that and that brother, man, he got caught up. He he made met this Japanese. He fell in love, and he just totally forgot about the the our forces. He wanted to live with her and mm -hmm. and, and 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 live their life peacefully and and, and very love lovably. And look what happened. They denied him that 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 privilege, that right that he owed. It's a right. He's a human being. He has to. He had a right to to get married to whoever he wants to get married to, and ain't nobody supposed to stop him. Nobody, right. you know. But the United States is always. The United States tells, says one thing, and then say something else. That's why Native Americans call, with all due respects, you know. Please, I'm I'm about to say something, and no reflection on nobody in particular. But that's why the, the Native Americans say the white man speaks with a forked tongue. <laughs> you know, but Once we know power, who the white man is. It's not us. It's the government. The government speaks with a forked tongue. You know, it's crazy. That's the thing. Like, there's no fucking accountability there. No. And, you know, so of course they get salty when a whistleblower lets the American people know things that we should be aware of anyways, because we should have some fucking transparency because exactly. there are that's fucking how we should, we should have, that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Everything that happens in this country, we live in here, we should know about it. Everything. There shouldn't be no secrets, but they call it top secret. <laughs> Information mm -hmm. they don't want us to know, they call it top secret. <laughs> And and did the, as a matter of fact, Trump has top secret in his house. <laughs> right, that's that's where, the, the other <laughs> thing is that they that the, um they want to paint everything with a broad brush so that if yeah. um yeah if you're opposed to the Ukrainian war, then they want to say uh the government says you're a Putin puppet or you're you're this or yeah. that. You know, they they want to categorize anybody as who's anti-war right now exactly as exactly. being a servant of of uh russia now that th this is yep. like the thing it's like well so so we got the choice tweedledee and tweedledum and neither one of them are any good you know both yep. of them are yep. pointing in the direction of war and attacks on minorities on yep on anything that's stable and they're they're uh systematically i uh, systematically they are dismantling uh democratic institutions in this in this country in the mother country 
the Democrats and the Republicans are working constantly at eradicating, you know, any idea that we have a democratic right to anything. And, yeah. um, you know, so that they, anytime you start pointing the finger at one of them, they say, oh, no, not, not us. It's not us. It's them. Uh, some freaking Republicans that are doing it, uh, you know, and then the Republicans, no, no, it's the Democrats that are undermining our individual liberty. So as long as we stay within that paradigm, which is there's no revolution within that within the, that paradigm, that's just a circle that goes round and around and around, never going anywhere for us. We have to have... Yeah. We, stake out an independent revolutionary position and we have to do it real soon because um, yeah. we cannot do anything as long as we're tied to one wing or the other of the Democratic Party. I have an old friend uh, he said he's, he's similar to the speak with a forked tongue he said it's, it's a two-headed snake that's what it is He's an old yeah. uh, Puerto Rican guy from the streets, and he said that this is you. You you make a choice. You, there's no choice, you know. So yeah. w the fact that we're coming up with uh, a different pathway that doesn't tie us to one uh, snake head or the other is really an important breakthrough, and we have to we have to strengthen that and amplify that. We got to be the honey badger. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell me about it. If I, if I had a spirit animal, that'd be the one I'd pick. Same. Honey badger gives no fucks. That's right. That's don't, right. don't give a fuck. That's right. <laughs> That's That's the right. Thing, like, a lot of people don't realize that those two parties are each other's controlled opposition. Their ideology is only separated by a hair. You know, um, and especially when it comes oh. to context with the working class, you know, the working class asks for help and the Republicans are like, fuck no. And the Democrats are like, we're going to wave a rainbow flag and say BLM and still tell you yep. no. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're all performative. Uh -huh. That's what it is. They're, yep. all, they're, they're all performative. Malcolm X um said it um said it best conservatives are, are wolves and liberals are foxes you know the only difference between the between the democrats and the republicans is their is their methodology republicans destroy everything in their path and they're blatant about um about 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 what their interests are and what they want to do while as liberals um have perfected the art of the of portraying themselves as the allies of marginalized group and playing off of the emotions off of, off off of oppressed people, but in actuality they're not going to do anything. In fact, they're just, they're just they're just going to do the same shit the conservatives would do. Right. So either way, they're both yep. they they are they are they are both they are pull, they are both two horses that pull the same cart. They're doing mm -hmm. the exact same fucking thing, regardless of regardless of who wins. Their interests align with upholding white supremacy and the contradiction of, of um of capitalism. They will pass. They will they will only pass policies um that um that that um that get them paid by the lobbyists of the bourgeois. They will pass policies that be, that um that that benefit companies over people. I mean we've seen. I mean we have seen this. With, with, with looking at Joe Biden, um, Joe Biden could have easily codified um, um, Ro Roe v. Wade. He could have easily co um, co um, codified it, but he didn't. Why didn't he do it? Because he knew that once that once Ro Roe v. Wade was shut was shut down, the the Democrats could use um, the emotional um, um, turmoil and, tr and trauma of women to get them to vote for um for for for, for the democrats again that's what that that's why they did it they don't care they don't give a single flying fuck about the people they will do whatever it takes to um to kill and to kill and subjugate as many people as possible just to put more money um into their pockets that's what it's all about for them oh, yeah. an even deeper long-term context 
that right there is exactly why the Democrats fucking sat on it and didn't codify Roe for 50 fucking years. Because if they'd codified it back in the fucking 70s when it passed, they wouldn't have been able to use that as an emotional manipulation tool to push for their vote blue no matter who. Just vote harder, just vote harder, just vote harder. Contribute to our campaign. Give me money, donations, and we'll pretend we're going to protect your rights. And that same concept applies across the board with every other fucking thing that they have done this fucking two-step dance with when it comes to reformism, because any step forward gets stepped back by the next administration. You're not really getting anywhere. There is no problem. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, oh, sorry. You know, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm of the belief that you know the the the, the Democrats and the Republicans is is the ruling class, so they say. But in actuality, you know, they're not the ruling class. They may be part of the capitalist class, but they're not the ruling class. The ruling class, to me, is sixty families that that control this country. As a matter of fact, control the world as far as yep. can. Sixty families. And they are not even part of the, the of the process, the Democratic or the Republican. They are on the outskirts of it, you know, and they're billionaires, billionaires, you know, and they and they pump all the money to a Democrat or they pump all the money to the Republican, and they're the ones that put the president into position, yeah. whoever they want, you yep. know. But we never yep. know. We never know who these people are. We, we know the Mellons. We know about the Mellons. We know about the Fords. We know about the Rockefellers. We know about so so many others, man. You know, and and mm -hmm. these are the people actually who are our enemy. I'm not saying that the Republicans is not our enemy because they are, you know. But they they represent the, the, well who we call the ruling class. They represent the ruling class. <laughs> right, it's the oligarchs. That's crazy. Like Yo, the uh, yeah, the exactly. politicians exactly. Yeah, the politicians that they pay for and control exactly. are merely oh, petty gosh. bourgeoisie. Yeah, the real bourgeoisie exactly. is those billionaires who own them, exactly. and that's part of the biggest problem that we have when it comes to the way our electoral politics work of money even being allowed into it, where these billionaire motherfuckers who are owners already of all of the corporations are allowed to legally bribe via lobbying everybody who's supposed to be a public employee where they don't exactly. serve us they're not held accountable to us they have no uh accountability when it comes to that either to actually work for their constituents who vote their fucking asses in their loyalty exactly. is to who they really work for and that's the motherfuckers lining their pocket in the excess of the 200k roughly that we pay each of these motherfuckers a year exactly yeah. um yeah. they're they're yeah. becoming millionaires because they're working for these billionaires doing their bidding it's, they're passing right, bills exactly. that benefit those well, corporations when this kind of ex, uh uh corruption at this level gets broadly exposed and it's transparently corrupt you know it's like uh it's like epstein's island or something they're all oh they're all in on it they're they're all going on these uh excursions you know and and playing with our uh our country you know i mean if, if we look at it that yep, way yep. but but they're yep. they're uh when they get exposed at this level, where everybody, 90%, something like this, of the country doesn't trust the government, doesn't, doesn't trust Congress, doesn't trust the president, doesn't trust the Supreme Court, they don't trust, then you have to have a uh, rule by force because nothing else will work. You, it's, it's a principle that Lincoln explained, you know, you can fool some of the people all the time, you can fool fool all the people some of the time, but you can't fool, fool all the people all the time. And that's what they've that's what they've attempted to do. This whole COVID thing helped them. Mm -hmm. Helped them to uh, keep us uh, you know, confused and unorganized, uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, as the facts begin to come out, you see how they played it 
they played the hand they were dealt and used it to instill more fear and confusion than was necessary. Plus, they didn't provide yeah. the people who were working. I've talked to nurses who, you know, who they had to borrow, beg, borrow, and steal and reuse uh, hospital equipment that hadn't been properly sanitized. And, they're, you know, they were still uh, suffering a lot at the front line of these these this epidemic. It's like um, every at every turn, they're exposed as corrupt uh, and and uh, greedy, not just greedy, but they're actually criminal. Uh, they're a criminal class and they're. And when the criminal gets exposed, they want to cover it up. They want to hide it. When they can't hide it, they they fight, fight. They fight back. And that's what's coming is that these these exposed operators and uh, agents of the ruling class are going to have to mobilize some kind of way to attack. They can't just defend because everybody sees right through every defense exactly so, i don't know it's just like um as soon as we abandon uh them and, and start making our, our own plans and putting zero zero expectations zero hopes with them to reform then we'll start getting someplace in chicago the progressive left is convinced, convinced itself that they've elected a real progressive this time. This is like about the tenth time they've talked about this. But they've they've the elected one, this one, new one. mayor, and he's going to pull us out of the uh, the jaws of fascism, and he's going to reform the police. And he and I'm like going, he ain't going to do shit because he's he has to do what the the uh, property developers tell him to do. This is a city, the plans have been made for development of Chicago that have been paid for, paid for by billionaires years ago. Ain't nobody gonna interrupt those plans. But so, so all the people that put their hopes and illusions with the Democratic Party right now are not just gonna get disappointed, they're gonna get beat down. They're going to get defeated. And so that's a very dangerous thing to hold out false hope for the people. And I don't want any part of that. It's honestly you know, disturbing. The, indeed. It's really disturbing. And, and you um, know, and the thing is, when, when, when you look at, when you look at, when you look at the people, so-called people who are, who are, who are running for president, when you look at it, there's nobody. Nobody. Really. There's nobody, you know, it's not even a socialist, not even a socialist. <laughs> I said, well, what's happening here? You know, so they, I mean, we know that Biden is on his way out. We know that. But who's on his way in? That's what we got to worry about. We ain't worried about his way out. We got to worry about who's coming in, you know. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think Wrong that, 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 that guy from now uh, from from uh, from Florida. Florida, what's his name? Ron DeSantis, the fuck, the fucking shithead. Yeah, um, yeah, him. I think for some reason or the other, I think he's gonna get it. I don't. And think if he him. gets it, if he gets it, you know who's his partner? Trump. Yep. Um, either him, um, either him or Donald Trump are going to, um, are going to win yeah. the election you know because um because um there's only so long that the bourgeois can fool the masses into thinking that you know that we live in a quote-unquote democracy before they have to get physical you know All right fascism is capitalism and the k under fa um under fa under fascism two things happen revolutionary radicalism and reactionary radicalism the bourgeois will scapegoat any non-white ethnic group to, um to make um to make um to make um to make the white population w w within the racial hierarchy think that the reason why things are are so shit is because 
of black people, it's because of indigenous people, it's because of Jewish people, it's because of Asian people, and so on and so forth, to uphold their own interests. Fascism has always been, has always come when when their privilege is threatened. That's what it's always used for. It's to uphold and protect privilege. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. That's what happened in fascist Italy. And that's exactly what is fucking happening here. It is a reaction to their privilege being threatened and they will and they will engage in in reactionary radicalization to um to make the masses uphold white supremacy and the contradictions of, of capitalism especially the petty bourgeois especially the, the petty bourgeois because at, because because the petty bourgeois face extinction from the national imperial bourgeois due, due to monopolization so what do they do? They escape they escape they they escape through ethnic minorities and make and make um and, and make white people think 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 that the reason why think things are shit is because um is because of non-white people. So that way the petty bourgeois can replace and become the national imperial bourgeois to um to, to benefit from the exploitation and oppression from society. So yeah. It's it's really you sad. Know, the military... Go ahead. Cool. The military militarization of the police is is very clear where we're heading. When you see the police, they no longer wear what they used to wear. They wear now they everything is military. If mm -hmm. you once you see that in in a, in, a, in a police force all over the country, then we know where we we're heading for. We were heading for to fascism, extreme fascism. You know, I, I could see it coming when, after George Floyd was murdered, that the Democrats decided yeah. to pander like a motherfucker, taking a knee while their white asses were wearing kente cloth, and you know, again, another moment of hashtag BLM, and then they fucking turned around and increased funding for military further militarization yeah. of the police. And it's like, yeah. really, how are you going to fucking take in me disrespecting people with wearing kente cloth, pretending like you're like, oh, I'm so sorry the cops are murdering you left and fucking right in the streets. We're going to arm them even more so now. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it, it's befuddling that more people haven't fucking picked up on this shit. And they still really think that the Democrats are going to reform policism for them. And it's like, uh, you cannot uh, reform pigs out of being yeah. what pigs are and always fucking that's, have that's been. Right. That's right. You're right. You are right. You cannot reform a pig. You know, that's why, and I hate to say it, but that's why a lot of men, a lot of Muslims don't eat pigs. Because <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, I, I think that I think that the one thing that one thing for sure we should not be discouraged uh, in any way from uh, seeking to change everything because there's a lot of people who have no more faith in this uh, system. The system yes. has lied to them. They followed every step that they were supposed to take get the education you'll be you'll be good oh well you're two hundred thousand dollars in debt for the rest of your life well that right. well there you go um every lie that they tell comes back on them in terms of disenchanted population people say this is bullshit and that that's the a common more and more common sentiment and we have to we have to rely on that and look to that. I was really encouraged that some of the young comrades were have begun to talk about how do we talk to the people who are getting screwed, but they don't they don't have a Marxist education. How do we talk to them? How do we help open them their eyes as to the class nature of the system? Well, that's an important consideration. That's a real important thing to do uh -huh. because if we if we don't do that well we guarantee we're going to put ourselves in a silo and we'll be you know um speaking quote unquote correctly while we're being uh you know 
sent to you know our respective uh, cells in concentration exactly. camps. That's yep. what they did. That's what they did in Germany. Everybody yeah. uh, had their you know had their own little group in the concentration camps. And the leftists in the early days were still fighting each other in the cell. I mean, this is not uh, going to work unless we figure out how to talk to that broadening sentiment that's saying, I can't make it in this system. I can't live under this kind of crap. I can't stand what's going on. And, I, you know, I want it to, to change. I mean, and yeah. it's almost that. At that level of understanding, you know, it's very, it's a very primitive, and it could go either way. It could go to the fascist side if they if they come up with answers that sound palatable, and people will say, "Well, let's go for it one more time." Um, patriotic duty, blah blah. If if that's the the way that this it, sh it shakes out, then then it's over. But if we can if we can go to the same damn people almost and and be able to win them over to a different vision then we then we stand a good chance because there's a lot of people that are disenchanted and they're all over the place yeah all over uh, the place politically too yep indeed um and the way we radicalize People is by providing for the for the materialistic needs. That is how we radicalize them. Because the way the Vanguard Party radicalizes the people is by showing them that is is by showing that they give a fuck about the masses, that they care about them, that 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 they, that, that that they are willing to cement themselves within their struggle and provide for their materialistic needs. And once and once that connection has been made between the vanguard party and the masses, the masses will um, will lead in the example of the party. They will lead in the ideological and political line of the party. They will engage in class agitation and organization of the party. That's what we need to do. We need to provide for our communities. We need to engage in grassroots movements. We need to actually, um, we need to, um, we need to provide for the materialistic conditions of our um, of um, of our communities and implement theory within our materialistic um, conditions to better our understanding of um, of theory and how to move class struggle towards communism. And, and once we do that, once we do that, the masses will will follow the example of the party through participation and observation. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to add. That you know what you know what was and I and I and I agree with Andy because he he was saying that a lot of people in this country are tired and they are they're very fucking tired and it in this Ukraine war is behind this Ukraine war they the United States is actually involved but they make it seem like they're not involved you know and the reason why the majority of the people have not moved the way they're supposed to. You know why? Because we, our left, what we call our left, is very disorganized. Very disorganized. You know, and so the little bit, the bits and pieces of us like like us, you know, and a few others, you know, there's only a few of us actually trying to organize, but we don't have you know, we 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 need in the left, in, in in what we call the left, we need to be come together, very organized, not only physically but mentally as well. You know, and that's our problem that we're not organized mentally. We may have the the same goals, but different ways of of, of trying to reach it, and that's our problem. One one mm -hmm. of the one of the comrades. Uh, um... I've been working with for years and uh, was explaining to me that the, that there's a new way that uh, most modern militaries work. And it's, um, it's like a mission orientation that, that they, that they don't try to micromanage every soldier in the field or get them to do everything one way that they, they give them the general 
mission, you know, which is lots of times it's like pacify by any means necessary. This, uh, these outraged peasants or outraged <laughs> workers in this country, we need to go in there and figure out we have to, you know, so they get people to speak the language, translators. They've been doing this since since the beginning. They did this in, as they genocided the, uh, the indigenous people of this country. They had people that worked for them, just like uh, Dennis Banks points out that the Crow and uh, uh, what's the other one, Arkanawa, they, they were working for the U.S. Army. You know, because they were they were split along tribal lines. Well, the U.S. now it has a lot of drones. It has a lot of other ways of taking things out that don't require a lot of people. Um, so they're doing that. But in terms of like the the forces that they're going to need and the orientation, they're going to try to get self-starters you know they're going to try to get people who can take the message out and in a way that's exactly what we have to do we don't we don't need to be micromanaged if and you can't in reality if i live in uh, new york and you live in uh, california there's no way i can do that do that but if we're on the level like chase talking about where we're thinking the same we have the same orientation we're we're blowing the same line that's what we used to say but we're we're talking the same talk we're we're pointing in the same direction that 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 will be pretty pretty hard to stop because it's like uh they're centralized politically but you're decentralized organizationally and people are free to make their own uh uh, plans according to their local um you know situation it's i don't see any other way it can go I, I i don't see us um you know modeling it any other way mm. um comrades um i just want to say that um that um that they are they all are awesome and also that this book club um is two hours long now <laughs> just, um, just want to uh, just want just, just want to inform you all thank you for the heads up i hadn't looked at the clock <laughs> huh you know like i'm sorry i have to leave the meeting i have a i have Aww. to take the call so but i really en enjoyed talking with you all and i think that we're making uh Make me real I can't hell yeah. wait to hear the new new improved audio. Uh -huh. Oh hell yeah. Oh hell yeah. Right. Things, I think things are gonna be way better now. I love every single one um one last one of you comrades. Y'all are amazing. And you know, as long as we continue to be critical of ourselves and our um in our socioeconomic system and our society and the internal contradictions within our society so long as we have a dialectical and scientific analysis of our materialistic conditions and how to apply that theory to praxis and better our theory to better to better meet the materialistic conditions of our society, we're going to be all right. <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah. am. I'm glad that I'm learning with. I'm I'm glad that I'm learning with you guys. I love you guys, and you know, you know, we're um we're family. We're revolutionaries. We are. We are. Um. We get. Um. We we we, we got to stick together and show that revolutionary love. We got. We got. And as Chase said, we got to show that love that we have for humanity and um and develop and develop that love through um through materialistic deeds through um through physical deeds in order um in order to, to transform society. That's what we gotta do. We gotta show that love. So hell yeah. Okay. Revolution is love. That's what Chair said. Yeah. Chair, check it for the right. Revolution yep. is love. Exactly. Yeah. You can't fight. You can't. You can't fight for the masses if you if you don't love humanity. You know. You can't fight exactly. for people if you don't love. If you if, if if you don't love people and sh um and believe that that, that that there is a possibility f for better. You can't. You gotta be optimistic in this because if you're, if you're not optimistic, if you don't have that love. They, then, then, 
then you're not going to be able to um to 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 engage in and um in, in, the, in the revolution to show that love to humanity so how yeah all right and, all right y'all take care you all too power. all power out to the people all power okay thank you guys for being here. So, bye, y'all. Bye. We'll see you guys Friday. Okay.